In terms of character, let's say you're writing for Alias or Xeno or Hercules, all of them have, you know, a main protagonist who has a certain voice and attitude and things they can do and not do. Have you ever, ever had points when you're writing or, or working it out with, you know, producers on the show or whatever where someone says, hey, she can't do that, like that's not, how, yeah. how do you know, how, how do you do that when you're working on a recurring character like that? How do you know when you've... I remember on Alias, um... Early on, one of the ideas that, we, that was tossed around was the idea that Jack, the father of Sidney Bristow, would be writing these letters from the mother and pretending that they were from her mother. Hmm. And I thought that was a pretty That's good pretty idea. Clever, actually. Yeah, we were going to go for that. And JJ said, no, I think that would be a violation of Jack, as his character. I don't think he's capable of putting himself in the shoes of this woman that he hates. And he basically, huh. he said, no, we, we, he vetoed that idea. That character though, wouldn't have had the empathy. Yeah, he never could have done that. And I'm, uh, that stuck out because, you know, as you said, it's a cool idea. And imagine, oh, these letters are not from my mother, they're from my father. You know, it sounds like a great alias thing. And he said, he said I think that would violate the character. Do you guys ever do that self-imposed? Absolutely. Just one of you catch oh, the other yeah. and like, you know what, that is a cool Absolutely. idea. But I think one of the things, you know, that, that certainly working on alias really, really taught us to do was to consistently with every word and every scene ask ourselves, would the character really do this? Is this really tracking them emotionally? Is this believable? And that's exactly what Bob's saying. You know, it's like you, you really have to make sure that people are behaving consistently with, with who their characters are. And if they're not, then you really can't do you it. You can be lured by the siren song of cleverness. Right. And well, there's that thing about killing your babies. I mean, right. you sound like you're not that precious to begin with, but do you ever have that moment where in your writing, one of you's like, no, no, this is such a great line. And and the other one finally, you know, finally convinces you, gee, we've got to yank it. Put, yeah, it, it, put it in the file, put it in the archives. Yeah. And it used to be that we had to talk each other out of that. Now it's become more that he'll come up with a line that I really like, and he'll, he'll want to kill it, and I want to keep it. <laughs> yeah, and vice you know, versa. And vice versa. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. It's, you know, I mean, when people say, like, well, can you give us the one piece of, you know, I think the one thing that has been proven to be true for us over and over again is, not to be married to your words necessarily, but be, to be married to the spirit of your words. Because it's important to know the idea behind what to you're writing. To have a vision of what you're doing. You know? But there's a thousand, like I said, there's a thousand ways that you can express that idea. And the more you kind of come at something, the more angles you see on possibilities. And, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not, I don't think we're advocating the point of view of like, don't be a, you know, don't, don't be a, fight don't for be your a writer. Yeah, of course you have to fight for your stuff, but you have to know what battle is the right one yeah, to fight. Yeah, you gotta choose your battles, definitely. Um, just out of curiosity, were you guys responsible for the, for the, the famous Xena episode? Well, the short answer is yes, and the real answer is no. Please, explain. <laughs> for those who don't know, we're talking about the, the famous uh, we Xena were, kisses. We were there for that, but we didn't, we didn't generate that. I think that had to go to... A, <laughs> you made to sure to be on set that day? Is that what's happening? No, they were shooting okay. in New Zealand. It was too, it was too uh, far for us. Okay. Too. That was Rob Tapper and R.J. Stewart, obviously Lucy Lawless as well, and Liz Friedman. That was mm -hmm. their baby. Is it possible to write something, uh, a line of dialogue or action to hook an actor or a director? Do you ever think in those terms? Absolutely. Can you, can you give me examples of, of when you think you've done that or how you approach that? I mean, writing for directors, you know, it's, about, it's all about not just, I think a lot of, you can write a scene very much setting the stage in a very sort of playwright way, or you can kind of get clever and really, you know, make it juicy for a director when you're imagining like, you know, like Fincher cam, that's something we call it, you know, when you're like going through the wires or something, or yeah, right. Sam Raimi cam where you're on the arrow on the itself, ground, you know, yeah. so there's little things like that that you can throw in that help, I think, a director go, oh, okay, I see, there's some tonal possibilities here where I can play and it's not just about the words. Huh. So, you know, being aware of that. And writing for actors is uh, huge. I mean, it's something that, you know, we, we strive for kind of with every script that we write. Because, you know, let, like taking Zorro is, is probably a really good example there because we knew that in the time that the first movie had been made and, you know, that, that they were asking us to do, nine years had passed and that Catherine had become a really big star. And, you know, she was this, you know, ingenue in the first movie. And so we, we knew that if they were going to make this movie, she had to have equal screen time and have a, a part that was just as juicy as his. So we very, very self-consciously designed the story around an idea that would support bringing her into the movie. Oh. Um, and that was very important. Well, that, that, that brings us to the, the scene that you guys chose as a particularly good example of your, strong example of your work. In Legend of Zorro, it's, it's I guess you would call it right, right as act one turns into act two. Right. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, 
it's a it's a long involved sequence, but it, the pinnacle of it is the is the ball dance where they have this amazing fight as they weave in and you know verbal argument as they weave in and out and dance and the villains there and it's so much going on. It's really a pretty intense sequence. I mean, when did when did you hit on the idea of this this spectacle scene and all the things that that were going to go on there? At story level, early early on, we knew that was going to be like you said. We knew that was Act One, the break, to Act Two, the big reveal that the woman who's left Zorro is now with another man. You know, we knew that was gonna be a, just a turning point. Okay, so, so even before you blocked out, it wasn't like a chronological, you bl blocked out first act and, okay, what, how, what do we do now? You the, knew you had to get to there? The, is that how it Yeah, you know, Martin Campbell, who we, we worked with very closely on the movie, who was really just a pleasure to work with from beginning to end, um, knew that he wanted to do kind of another, he wanted to escalate a version of what he'd done in the first movie by having another dance scene between the two of them. And, you know, it was a, you know, it, it was a great way to physicalize the tension between them because, you know, they were, they're, they're, they're combating each other in that scene. And in the earlier, you know, in the first movie, it's more about them coming together. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was a fun way to kind of physicalize what was going on with them. And an homage to the, to the first one. Yes, exactly. Because, I mean, you yeah. must have to, take that into consideration. Oh, We've yeah. got a, an iconic property, first of all, with Zorro, but then also this pre-existing film that the people, I mean, it was pretty big. Yep. Uh, so do you feel conscious of having to, there's certain elements that have to be there? Is that where you started with the sequel? Yes, you know, the first one, especially the tone. The tone of the first movie is pretty amazing in that it goes between genuine, you know, drama, revenge, and then almost Bugs Bunny-like comedy. Um, that's a tough balance, and we knew that that was part of it. That was the main thing we were trying to make sure we were aware of as we went through it, that we wanted the, the drama between Alejandro and Elena to be real without being at the expense of being able to be funny and you know have dopey stuff with the horse, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Obviously, when you know you're writing for you know, the actors that you're writing for, that, that helps, but you know, one of the amazing things about that scene is what Antonio brings to it. I mean, do, do you, how does that play out when you're, when you're trying to craft the dialogue? It means a lot of Alex and I writing in Spanish accents. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. We, that, more than any, lines by yeah, more than any movie we've ever written, we were walking around going, no! You know, like, you know <laughs> we just, it's just how we got to the voice of, of the scene. But we were really self-conscious about knowing that we wanted the dialogue to be uh, very entertaining and very funny and very fast. So we were in, you know, Preston Sturge's territory, or we were in, you know, His Girl Friday territory, and that was really, like, something we really knew had to be an element of the scene for it to work. Did you guys actually look at, for yeah, example, his Girl Friday? Stuff, Did you go yeah. back and look at some of the? I, we didn't really go back and look at them as we, we wrote them. We just studied and watched so many of those movies and loved them so much that I think it was just ingrained in us, and we knew we had to tap into that to get there for the for the scene. And then, where do you start with the dialogue? Then, how do you how do you get into the to the scene? Well, first it was to block just kind of exactly what information needed to come out so then you can know where you can play because there's, there's, there's a lot going on in that scene. We're setting up the bad guy, we're setting up peripheral bad guys, we're setting up the exposition of the world. The plot of the movie. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So blocking out just what's, what is a good flow of information, number one. You know, do, should they talk about this before they meet Elena? Should we hear more plot? Do you want to hear that after they've met so that you have the tension of them having this terrible reveal that way you're not really paying attention but you're getting it out. So first step for us is to block literally you know, what, who's going to say? What's the flow? Yeah, what's the flow? But like, actually, you know, a great sort of little, you know, microcosm of that, you know, those choices are, there's a, there's a fair amount of plot exposition that's getting out in that movie. It's, you know, the states and the states are divided and Civil War's looming and all these right, kinds of things. Right, you're meeting this admiral or general Those for a writer are like the most unpleasant, unfun part of the movie because you're like, okay, this is plot, I got to get it out. You know, it's got to be seamless. It's got to be seamless. It's got to be entertaining. People have to understand what's going on. Um, but a lot of the time it's where the audience is least kind of interested, you know, and you want to try and roll through it quickly. So one of, the, one of the decisions that we made very early on in conceiving of the sequence was that if we established the tension between them and we had them collide and we, you know, had him know that sh she was with another man, then that was really going to be the pervasive thing hanging over whatever plot exposition was coming out. So it would train the audience subconsciously into hearing that differently. Mm. And it would, it, would, it would actually make them want to hear it. So... That was, you know, a big choice. Because now the made. small talk is keeping them from talking about the real thing. Right. right. So and that's like a tension. It's a deliberate distraction. Right. 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 Did the scene take a lot of different forms? Did that sequence take a lot of different forms when you wrote it, or did you have it pretty 
settled it at, at, in the outline and then? The main through line of the scene was always the same. I think details of plot changed right. as we went along. You know, there were different points that we were emphasizing in the scene, but you know, the kind of... But that's a very modular part of the scene yeah. overall. So those details of when the colonel and everybody are talking, that, that changed a lot, but the overall structure okay. of the scene and the kind of the other elements were pretty much set. How did it change? Can you get into any specifics? Do you remember how it, how it evolved in the, in the writing when you were doing that? I think we were emphasizing different, um, yeah. different elements of like, there was a, you know, at one point we were thinking about that the, because it was a, the plot was about um, generating a, an explosive. And mm -hmm. I think we, were, we had introduced like a, a guy from China because China was the first to discover, you know, gunpowder, gun I think. Fireworks. Fireworks or something. And, uh, you know, there was a guy there. And so that stuff ended up getting pulled out. But you guys must obviously must have done some research, research to put it in that, yeah. that time period and what was actually going on. Yeah, there. yes. Quite you a lot. do that deliberately to find something to hook the hook the plot on and hook that scene on. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the case of Zorro, we got really lucky because in Nitro 18, wasn't invented that year. Yeah, and, <laughs> and in 1850, California was on the verge of becoming a state. So we were like, wow, we have. What was to that moment <laughs> like when you realized? It was You're like, good this luck. is too easy. <laughs> can't be. What? Uh, like, are you sure, good. really? Well, there's an election for the state? Really? There? History's <laughs> going to hand us the plot of our movie? Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is the year of the 19th century. Yeah. And, and, and ironically, a lot of the critics were like, oh, it's so inaccurate. And it was actually very accurate. It's very yeah. weird. Yeah. Huh. No one bothered kind of the, to Google California history, I guess, when they were writing about it. What about the, um, the setting, like this... this Big extravagant ball uh, atmosphere. I mean, what did that bring to it? Was was that always the the case? How did that evolve? Did you have well, other Zorro? Options? You know, if you read, you know, it's been around for since 1919, and if you read all that stuff and see all that stuff, it's always about the juxtaposition of like high society versus you know Zorro's background as basically a peasant. So oh, this is a class issues through. Yeah, so that juxtaposition is always around, and, and their fight is all about him basically deciding that he is feeling insecure about the fact that she's now with a rich guy. Right. And he literally says, oh, I guess you're too good for me. So that, that class uh, anxiety Yeah, is that line about of, it, your, your mother or your father would be so proud. Exactly. Right? So that class anxiety I think, was always, I think, part mm -hmm. of the, just the source material. And uh, can you talk some more about the, the meeting of the, the villain and the hero at this point and how you, how you wanted that to, to happen? Well, in, <laughs> in, you know, in classic, you know, fashion, I think we really wanted it to be um, that they were able to trade barbs equally. You know, it was all about kind of the subtext of what they were saying to each other. Um, and we didn't want to make them too villainous. I mean, we try to make right. them like, you know, hey, listen, I know you're the ex-husband, but no hard feelings. And he tells Elena, if you want to get the heck out of here, let's go. I don't want to put you through this nonsense, you know. Right. We're trying to not make him, you know, yeah, mustache twirl well, he's right French. away. Yeah. So he's right. Already you're behind the eight ball there, yeah. <laughs> but uh, We're trying to humanize him as much as possible and give him a point of view. And, you know, that's the most important thing you can do, especially with bad guys, is give them, like, a really legitimate point of view that the audience can hook into so that they're not just mustache twirly. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And uh, there's a lot of banter in this. It starts with the banter between Antonio and his, his, uh, his, his priest friend, right? Yeah. I mean, do you guys... Do you guys Verbally, like bat stuff around. I mean, describe totally. what it looks like in your office or wherever you work. Uh, a lot of video games, a lot of toys laying around. Um, we sit across the desk from each other. All the essential tools of the trade. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, a little grand theft guitar. Bob plays guitar while we write a lot. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we play the Spanish theme. Of yeah. Do you, while we do you were... play? Uh, you know, flamenco and. See. Si. <laughs> yeah. And I actually learned. What, I don't even. We know have a little surprise for you. We brought your guitar. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But yeah, no, we, we've always, we write as we always have written, which is line for line, bouncing lines back and forth across the table. You know, that's just how we write. It's and, a conversation. And it makes the, you know, a lot of the time, we'll, you know, if we have disagreements about dialogue or somehow the tension of those disagreements will find a way to translate into the work, you know, and it makes it more interesting, I think. So that's, uh, it's always a really fun, good process. And in, particularly in the case of Zorro, it was really fun because it was just, you know, we got to kind of just, live in the universe of, of as, as I said, a Preston Sturges movie, and that's a great place to exist. With an accent. With an are accent. you very physical, too? I mean, are you doing the, you know, with the accent and everything? I'm picturing you there with the hat. <laughs> Standing on top of our desks with a... I remember interviewing the writer of, uh, of Master and Commander, and he was mm. talking about banging out the story with Peter Weir and how Weir would always bring these, like, incredible props from, like, the 18th century, and <laughs> they'd wear these hats and swords and... and uh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Do you, I mean, do you ever no, find, like, external... <laughs> 
We do have lightsabers you know, in the office, chaps, however. And you're whipping each other. <laughs> we do have lightsabers in the office. And every once in a while, we, will, we will pull them out and have a, have, a, have a fight. But no, yeah, mostly it's just dialogue. We don't, we don't get up and run around. Okay. Uh, what did you draw on for the, for the husband and wife back and forth, which was, for anyone who's married, pretty, pretty rich? Well, first of all, we're married, basically. I was about to say this. You know, not to, to each, each other. other. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you are too. Basically, oh. for I mean, 15 years we've been writing together now. Thanks That's, for announcing it on our show. Yeah, yeah. No. We're, we're very happy. We're both, you know, we're both married, and we're both married to each other, and it's, it's you know, we grew up together, and we, you know, we, uh, w- w- as Bob said, we've developed a voice together, and so, you know, it's fun. It was, I think, fun to translate a lot of that stuff to the kind of the, the history between the two characters. Do you ever feel like your, your uh, ethnic background has played positively into your writing or enriched it in some way? Huge. Do you, do you feel that way as well? Especially in Zora, I felt it. Yeah, but, you know, because writing is, it's not just a recitation of some person's life. It's whatever perspective you bring to whatever the idea or the concept is. So, you know, you want to bring that to, that to anything as a writer. So not being from this culture, I automatically have a perspective that I think, you know, Gets into the sauce that that just fits into writing. It's not necessarily a Latin perspective. It's just a perspective on the culture that allows you to to take a step back as you'd want to do anyway as a writer when you're writing about anything. And you know, since Alex too lived out of the country um, for a while and learned another language, you know, we both kind of are able to sometimes tap into that sort of outside of this country's perspective. Um, I think it works. There's a big part of us that you know that's tied to Mexico. And so it was a very comfortable place to live while we were making the movie. Hmm. Uh, do you ever think uh, your youth plays to your advantage in the industry? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure it does. Um, I think, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry that tends to put a high premium on, on youth. But, you know, I, I used to think that it was all about making it as fast as you could, as young as you could, and I actually don't really believe in that anymore. I think it's about getting experience and then you know, having the ability to deliver a script that gets made, and that's not something that is necessarily about how young you are. You know, it's about just how dedicated you are to your craft and you know, the experience that you bring to, to what you do. It can be a trap, too. I think sometimes we are perceived as being a little hipper than we actually are. We're kind of old souls. Yeah, we're not you, see, you think that plays sometimes, against you? Sometimes, because sometimes, you know, we're, we're not going that way. I think sometimes in listening to us, uh, an executive or something may perceive that we are trying to pitch some kind of a hipster thing that they like, and we're actually pitching something very classic. Hmm. And it slightly colors our perception of what we're talking about sometimes. Huh. But I think in general, it's probably been a, a help. Uh, is there much of a screenwriting community in LA? Do you guys know your peers in the industry? Do you ever read each other's stuff? Or? We have a couple. I wish we had a broader, yeah. you know, um, sort of base to draw from, but we really don't know very many screenwriters. It's just the ones we've worked with, mainly through yeah. TV, hmm. you know? I, anyone that you've worked with or you've read that you feel like you've really drawn inspiration from or practical insight or anything like that? Anything that's ever been made that, that we were fans of, we've read the screenplay and learned a lot. How do you get your hands on them? I mean, do you go to like Hollywood? Well, the internet makes it the easiest thing in the world now. You know, there's like three trillion websites that have a thousand scripts on them and you just go check it out. And the thing that's great too is like, you know, when I I was uh, in in high school, I worked um, at a talent agency uh, for a couple summers and and made it a point to become friends with the script librarian (laughs) so that she could give me, you know, you know, so I... And that was before the internet, so those scripts were precious. Yeah, so, you know. Get those scripts and be like, wow. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, you know, can I have four drafts of Blue Velvet, please? You know, (laughs) and I'd read all four drafts, and you see see the choices that he made and how the script evolved. Oh, so you'd read the the, Oh, absolutely, everything, and, you know, now that's all online. So it was always a really important thing. We always sought out material to read. Do you think that's essential to anyone trying to learn? Totally. Them? Absolutely. It is so critical. And it's even more essential to try and read more than just the one draft. Right. Well, I remember reading the two, dra- the two main drafts of Seven. Yeah. And the, the last act totally. is yeah, absolutely. absolutely, you know, the first way yeah, he yeah. went with the big, you know, add as, throw as much crap and spectacle in there as possible. Yeah. And, then, and then that brilliant, you know, quiet dread of the, of mm-hmm. the final version. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there other ones that you that you found particularly helpful that you've read that you you thought wow this is great and you maybe refer to it? Um, Butch Cassidy. 
William Goldman, just, you know, I think the, the writers that we tend to be, t- t- tend to have been influenced by when we were first starting out were writers who l- just laid it out on the page so incredibly well. There, it, it, was, it wasn't like you were reading a script. It was like, it was like someone was telling you a story, oh, wow. you know? And so you turn these pages and it's really like someone's speaking to you. Right. And that was a really important thing. And so, you know, looking at the way that William Goldman just laid it out on the page in Marathon Man or in Butch mm-hmm. Cassidy, you know, it, 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 it was like narrative. It wasn't really, It was you know, different than stuff that came before it. Yeah. Right. Read stuff. And actually, Shane Black, part of why he, I think, kind of really shifted things around in the 80s was because people weren't writing action screenplays like that. Right. They weren't really taking that sensibility and like putting it on the page. It was so such a voice in Lethal It was such a voice. So, yeah, totally. yeah. It's a really good script, even if you don't, you know, you're not into action, like it's a great script. Yeah, it's read. just a great read, and, and, and he's, he, will, he will converse very directly with the reader. You know, he'll say, you know, and you know, he'll, he'll have a humor about it too. Like, you know, I, I'm, one line that stuck out for me that I remember reading and, and you know, it would be like, exterior, you know, Beverly Hills house, the kind of house I'm gonna buy when this movie's a huge hit, you know? <laughs> right. That was like the, that's right. like the first line of description. And so whether you like that or not, you're engaging with it, you right. know? And it's important to remember that kind of thing. One, one line that I love from that in the action line is that the, when Riggs finally escapes the torture and he, and he goes and he bursts into the room where Murtaugh and his daughter yeah. being, and he writes the line says, basically Riggs destroys the men in this room. There is nothing he elegant about, about it. it. He doesn't, there is nothing movie making yeah. about it. He just kills yeah. everyone in the room. Right. And I remember thinking, yeah. wow, you can see it already yeah. on yeah. the page. Yeah. yeah, I remember that too. And, uh, you know, and the structure of that movie is genius. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, do you show your other work to, to other writers before you, before you turn it in? Or you feel like because more you so, have each other? More so as we get older, yes. And as we meet more. I mean, the, the more people you can get into your inner circle that you trust to read something and be constructive, the better. Is there someone in that circle that you, you know, that's a, a successful screenwriter that you feel has been helpful, given you helpful input? I mean, Damon. Damon Lindelof was a good friend. Um, that was really helpful on Transformers. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's really been a great kind of a, a voice to bounce stuff off of. Do you guys have a favorite line from your own, from your own scripts that... No. Yeah, I like one from the island. Who's God? Uh, you know, when you close your eyes and you wish for something really hard, God's the guy that ignores you. It's <laughs> good. All Particular right. worldview. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys do when you're stuck for inspiration? Do you guys, if you're ever looking for a detail or a setting or a character trait or something, do you have methods for doing that? Do you read a lot? Do you have music, uh, other movies? Read a lot. Listen to, he listens to soundtracks a lot sometimes while, while mm. we're off separately. Um, and inspiration, sometimes we get stuck on a scene where it's, it's not so much inspiration, it's just we know what we want to do, it's just how do you do it so that it works? And that's often when we'll refer to other scripts and try and think of what is the closest scenario that we can imagine in a movie that we've seen that's not exactly what we're doing because we're, you know, we're not trying to rip it off, but that got through a similar problem. How do they literally lay it out on the page? And we'll try and think, okay, so that, the breakup scene, whatever. Hmm. How, what, was, what was the breakup scene that we just remember working? As, and then we'll refer to the script and see exactly how did they sell it such that it ended up being what it is. Right. That's something we do a lot. Yeah, it's interesting how cautious writers are about talking about that when in almost any other industry it's okay to say, oh, you know, what worked for this company or totally. what worked in this marketing strategy and let's apply that to ours. We treat it much be- like the law where it's like if you were in the front of the Supreme Court, you'd say in Plessy versus Ferguson and that's how case law is built. So we'll say in, in, you know, in Riggs versus Mr. Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You That's know, great. And you treat it as case law, and you can build case law based on things that worked before. Can you think of an, a specific example? Like you, I don't know if the breakup used as an example is that one you actually used and, and what you referred to. What was the scenario that you were trying to crack? I mean, we do it all the time. I can yeah. think of a million things. I mean, I'm no, I'm sure, I know we reference in <laughs> Kramer versus Kramer, obviously. Really? <laughs> In what? Oh, in, in her, her walking her, out, you know, yeah. and just how, you know, we went through a million versions of the scene where he leaves and she throws him out and, you know, Kramer versus Kramer came up early on. I was like, okay, how, she, how did she do that in such a way? You know, that, that's actually a great example because, um, you know, Catherine in that movie leaves Zorro and takes her child away and I think the audience's heart is sort of with Zorro. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there were a thousand ways for her to look unsympathetic in that choice. And then she goes off and she's with another man and there were just, there were a lot of ways that the audience could have really disliked her. Right. And, um, the thing that was so incredible about Kramer versus Kramer was this is, that's a story about a woman who very neglectfully leaves her child because she's confused 
and sort of bails completely at the beginning of the movie and then comes back into the movie and says she wants to take him back and manages to stay from not only that scene but through the entire movie totally sympathetic. And, you know, it was kind of a miraculous feat and it, it just spoke to how sort of honest the movie was about who those people were. And so that was a, you know, that, was, that would be a good example of a movie that we had really looked at in kind of asking ourselves how we were going to craft her character and how we were going to make her sympathetic. Right, okay. So it, you also mentioned earlier about that you read when you're looking for inspiration. Do you read when you're writing a script? I mean, not literally at that moment, but uh, other things other than screenplays? I mean, do you, do you look to the world outside or do you, you do. sort of... Yeah, I mainly read nonfiction for inspiration, just really? reality. I have a real hard time reading fiction now. Does it typically reference in some way what you're working on or is it... No, sometimes that's the best thing is to find, you'll find something, topic that's, that you had no idea might be related. And it turns out to be related. The more I read, the more it seems to me that everything's related <laughs> in some way or another. And finding those connections is great when you do because it allows you in some you know, material you're doing to bring in topics that you never imagined you know, that suddenly become relevant. Uh, speaking of bringing in things that you never would have imagined, we have a screenwriting exercise for you that we call the object. Uh, Frederick, the tray. Okay, the way this works is when I ask Frederick, he will lift the plate and there will be an object there that's random that you guys have never seen before. And you can take it from the tray and look at it, talk it out and fill the story out of it. No, it's fun, fun. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll talk about where your ideas came from. Okay. Got it? Got it. Frederick, please. <laughs> your object, gentlemen. Ah, just on time. Thank you, Frederick. And now this is only a prop. You're not to take any of these. Well, you could do it like The Insider, where the wrong pill into the wrong prescription kills a bunch of people and it has to become a class action suit against Tylenol or something like that. Kind of a Michael Manny, you know. Uh. That's cool. Maybe, um, maybe you could do a thing where uh, someone's walking down the street and searching through their purse and this pill bottle falls out of their purse and starts rolling across the street. And you're sort of following the pill bottle as it takes you past certain sort of key things that would establish the environment uh, around you. Like, you know, it rolls underneath cars and it, you know, hits something and then bounces, you know, the curb and then bounces off somewhere else. And it could be the opening credit sequence of something, maybe. Maybe we follow the pill bottle around. Maybe it's a clock. Maybe the movie only lasts as long as the pills last. You take one, you know, at the beginning cool. and the medication, the whole plot only lasts. This is the clock, the bookend to it. You know, until the, when this runs out, the movie's over. Holy mackerel. <laughs> you guys could just put on a clinic. Holy mackerel. All right, so uh, an interesting distinction to make here is that you built two entire plots around this, and you went for something very sort of aesthetic and, and almost gimmicky. And not, I don't mean that in no, a pejorative right, way, right. But, but that you know that would be a brilliant way to, to, to introduce the environment. Um, does that... I mean, it seemed very distinct to me. Do you guys... Are you conscious of anything like that in your, in your normal writing, where your ideas um, develop like that? I need to know the theme more, I think, to, to move forward than maybe you do. So I always go to that first in my mind. It's like a kind of an overarching kind of a theme or a, or a you know, framework. Yeah, Bob looks at big picture stuff like really well. You know, he, 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 he kind of gets like a holistic view of the whole thing. And, like, Alex is more like our director, you know, so he thinks more visually and more, you know, you know how to really set it up and how to hook a director. Huh. When you, when you, went, the question that you asked earlier, which is, you know, where you get your inspiration from when you're stuck, I mean, f you know, first off, having two people, having a partnership makes writer's block a much harder proposition because if I'm stuck, then Bob can push us up the hill for a little while and vice versa. Um, but for me, like, if I'm stuck, I need to go back to something uh, emotional to figure out what path to take. So, you know, as Bob said, like, I'll get in my car and drive around and listen to soundtracks. Total loser, total geek, but that's just, it's just what <laughs> hey, I do. It works. You know, you know, it's just what yeah. I do. It's like, you can walk on your hands you know, down sunset. And it can be everything yeah. from, you know, throw on, you know, John Williams' Superman score to, you know, um, to something much more obscure and small, you know? And, um, and it depends kind of what, on what, what we're looking for. But you ever go towards Bernard Herrmann? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, his Vertigo is actually one I go to a lot. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, you know, I think um, I think that uh, maybe what that is is that I'll tend to look for a moment 
Just what's one moment that hooks me into something and then maybe build off that moment. You know, Bob will start big and then get smaller. So. Uh, yeah. That sounds like a great partnership yeah, in that yeah. sense. Yeah. I had no idea. That works. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. great. I hope we, I hope we haven't just broken it. the system because we explained it. Like, oh no, the mystery's gone, right?